we zijn weer terug in uh, Den Haag, terug in Theater aan het Spui, terug bij de Border Sessions en we zijn terug voor ons allerlaatste gesprek dat we hier zullen hebben. Um, please introduce yourself. My name is uh, Mikkel Kroosa and I'm from uh, Denmark. Uh, I had the pleasure today uh, talking about uh, the blockchain, which is uh, the underlying uh, technology under Bitcoin, mm -hmm. which uh, is interesting for Bitcoin, but also has a lot of uh, potential in many other areas. So uh, that was my talk today and the reason why I'm here at the, the border sessions. Okay, let's let's start uh, to, well, to make it as simple as possible. When, when you are at the party and, and you have to explain to someone what you do, if you use words like blockchain and Bitcoin, most people will think, I don't know what, he, what he's uh, talking about. So, so what do you tell? <laughs> That's why I don't uh, work with uh, blockchain anymore, actually, because it was way too hard at parties. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is a, a remnant of my past work. I used to be in finance and IT. Now I have my own company that does data science, data analysis. But back from that time, I spent a lot of time looking into money, the evolution of money going from analog cash money over to digital money using your smartphone. But then of course also looking into some of the fundamental changes into money, so with the Bitcoin and blockchain. So if I had to introduce myself back then, I would probably say that um, I work with the, the digitization of money and how we are developing new types of money. Okay, okay. And, and what would people ask you then? So what new types? We have good money, why do we need new money? They would, uh, the first question would usually be, so it's uh, money on your mobile phone. Uh -huh. And uh, I would say, yes, that's where we see a lot of the innovation going on. But the more you start thinking about money and the more you start uh, diving into money, the more crazy money gets. For instance, just if you take cash, like the money we have here, cash is only a little part. It's maybe 5% of all money is cash. The other 95 are ones and zeros in a Digitals. Digitals in the cloud Somewhere. already. <laughs> so when people say, you know, will we, will we have digital money or we will have a, a digital economy. My answer is usually we already have. We already have most money, most value, most worth is already digital. But the money we have and the cash we have is also arbitrary. It only has value because you and I decide that it has value. Yeah. Back in the time, maybe you could go and you could, uh, you could exchange it for gold at your national bank or something like that, but you cannot do that anymore. So it's basically just paper that we painted on. So and it has value because we trust in it. If you uh, take a country like uh, Zimbabwe, uh, yeah. where you have hyperinflation, that's <laughs> yeah. because you can have hyperinflation like this. Because when everything is trust-based and trust disappears, it just skyrockets. And. Um, this sort of arbitrary uh, kind of money is also what started Bitcoin, you could say, is that some uh, hackers uh, or hacktivist activists were uh, a bit uh, tired that money was this free floating, floating thing that was uh, uh, controlled by government and that could be changed at will by government. The interest rate could go up, it could go down, the amount of money uh, that would be in circulation could go up, could go down. So uh, that is part of the reason also why you have uh, a system like Bitcoin, because there all the rules of the money are written into code. Uh -huh. So that means that you cannot change it from one day to no the next. No one can change it. No one basically can change it. No. Well, if you want to change it, you need you have a lot. You have something called miners, like yeah. computers yeah. who are working on it. If you want to change it, you need to have more than half of them agreeing to updating their software to the new version. So. Instead of having maybe a handful of central bankers or a handful of politicians, then you need the, the majority of the whole system. So it's, you could say it's a little bit more uh, democratic. It's not as flexible and smooth, but no. uh, you know what's going to happen tomorrow and the next day and uh, basically forever because uh, it's written into the code. Mm. So it's, it's, it's better money? Oh, that's hard to say. It's, uh, it's a very different kind of money. Because there's a lot of implications that uh, even I can really think through. For instance, if money is power, 
and which it is. Which it is. Let's say it yeah. is that, yeah. and you as a state no longer control your own money. Does that mean that you are a state without power? And what does that mean? What does it mean if uh, we can no longer, let's say you wanted to go to war in Iraq back in 2003, and you didn't have control of your own money, you had to go out and ask for money, would we ever have had a war? Uh, if you cannot print your own money, uh, but you had to go out and, and get it from the blockchain from each citizen, uh, what kind of, let's say for the police, what kind of offenses would you want to donate to? Would you want to prioritize, let's say, a hard crime, murder or something like this? Or would you also want to prioritize uh, uh, smoking uh, weed uh, somewhere, uh, having that being illegal or something mm -hmm. else? So there's a lot of um, flexibility for a government when it can just print its own money instead of having to go out and every time ask for money from the public in some regard. Yeah. But then on the other hand, if everything is in a, on a blockchain system, and on a blockchain system, you can see all the money moving around every time. Like you have a, the, compute, the complete overview. So if you were an economist, it would be your wet dream. You could always just press a button. You could see where all the money is in society, how it's moving around. But you could also, for each little transaction, you could put a little tax fee if it was your own blockchain. So you could have like automatic uh, taxation for the government. So they would have a little bit of money coming in all the time. Not a lot of money to like finance a war, but you know, a steady stream of income. So for a government, it could be both a loss of power and it could be a sort of automation of having a, a yeah. taxation. Yeah, so it would change a lot if it would. It would change a lot, and that, that's just only talking about the, the money part. Yeah. What, what is interesting about a blockchain is that it is distributed among all these miners, all these computers. They all have a copy. So that means if you shut down uh, half the network, even 95% of the network, it doesn't matter because the last 5%, they also have an identical copy, uh -huh. and then it can spread again. So it's very hard to uh, suppress or, 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 or kill. And you're not, you cannot change it. Once the blockchain has been created, you cannot change the block uh, in the chain. So you can use that for several things. You could put uh, the property deed of your house, you could put inside the blockchain. Then it's there forever. People know you own the house. And if uh, you at some point want to sell your house, then you can like transfer it. But you don't need a notary service, or you don't need uh, like a, a government officials having everything registered, who owns what. You will be able to do that in a blockchain system. For a country like yours and mine in Denmark, maybe not so relevant, but for a country uh, in South America or in Africa, Africa where they have yeah. no system, yeah. then it's a, a cheap, it's a secure, and it's a, a more or less flexible way of, uh, of uh, securing property rights. And if you were just right now, if uh, you wrote a brilliant piece of uh, software or you wrote a, a beautiful piece of music, you would be able to make what is called a, a hash of that. Imagine like a fingerprint of it. Mm -hmm. So from this fingerprint, it's, it's a unique fingerprint for whatever you created over here. But if you look at the fingerprint, you won't be able to figure out what I created. But if I at some point show this, then I can prove that this piece of music or software is indeed the thing that created this fingerprint. So that means you can take this little fingerprint and you can also put it into the blockchain. And then it gets a timestamp and it's there forever. That means that if you had a brilliant invention and later on somebody stole your idea, you would be able to prove, no, look at this <laughs> fingerprint. This fingerprint is the identical fingerprint of this program that I created in 2015. Therefore, I was the first one, and this guy who stole my idea came after me. I can yeah. prove it. Yeah. Uh, so there are many, many uh, interesting uh, applications. And, and many advantages. Yeah. Are there, are there any disadvantages when you say, well, it's also dangerous because... Uh, there are some things that I don't really, uh, that I'm not able to, uh, to figure out the consequences of. Uh, we talked a little bit about the whole government thing, but that's a money thing. But on the blockchain system, people are starting to uh, imagine autonomous corporations. Like uh, you would, 
we would make an agreement, like let's say insurance, I'm a farmer in Africa, I take out crop insurance, like if uh, the price falls under a certain level, I would get paid, or if there's a flood or something. I, 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 uh, I make that agreement on a blockchain system. Yeah. This blockchain system then looks for a drop in the price, and if it drops, then it pays out to me. If there's a flood, if it records a flood from some source, it pays out to me. This is very basic, but the idea here is that there's no humans involved, basically. It's all machine, it's all on its own. You can also imagine having uh, cars, self-driving cars are coming mm, now. Yeah. That, let's say the car is born from the factory and it owes the factory a certain amount of money because it was created. Then it goes out and drives, it picks you up, you pay it by the blockchain maybe. It uh, sets some money aside for itself and it sets some money aside to pay the debt when it was created. At one point, maybe it has paid off its debt, and then you have a self-owning, self-driving car which, with its own money, which gets richer and richer. Yeah, maybe that that and the money it uses to pay maybe repairs, maybe it buys other cars. But so maybe it, it buys something evil like weapons or things like that. <laughs> I, I don't know. Is that possible? <laughs> maybe. I, 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 well, so far everything is coded, so it's like, but imagine. Right now, it's sort of on the cockroach stage, like you have the little am amoebas, and we are trying to figure out what they can do. But these are companies organized by themselves, living by themselves on the internet, and basically impossible to turn off because the blockchain will always keep them alive. What, the, what does that mean? I have no idea. No. Maybe what the... It sounds a bit scary. It sounds... Uh, there's something in technology, you know the black hole? Uh -huh. uh, there's something called a singularity. And that's when you approach the border of the black hole, then the black hole sucks in light. So that means we cannot see beyond the event horizon. It becomes a singularity. Maybe this is a sort of singularity where you say, okay, we have the internet becomes alive. What happens after that? Maybe we can't tell. Maybe it's like a, one of those lines where we just simply cannot cross. tell what's on the yeah. other side. Well, yeah. we can cross it, but I can't tell you what's on the other side. We'll have to cross it, then we'll have to then find we out. Know. You're not but you've seen the Terminator movies. Yeah. So let's, uh... <laughs> yeah, that's, why, that's why I'm a bit scared. I think, oh my God, where is this ending? <laughs> All the science fiction. You are no longer in 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 this blockchain world anymore. I uh, just on the on the periphery. Yeah. Yeah. So so, so why why did you t leave it behind and 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 do something else now? Uh, I've always been interested in uh, in data science and trying to figure things out with uh, using uh, statistics and and uh, and data analysis. And I was in a very interesting but also uh, a small uh, organization when we were doing the finance and IT. And I got an opportunity to uh, to uh, go to another company, you just normal career advancement. Yeah. So I took that opportunity and then I sort of moved away from uh, all of the finance uh, technology part and uh, slowly got more and more busy doing the, the analysis and the data gathering yeah. and the data collection. And then actually after a while I quit that job and now I have my own uh, business uh, where I, uh, you know, gather data, help uh, organizations structure their own data, and then we dive into it and we see if there's some interesting stuff we can find yeah. out that helps. Uh, so it's mainly uh, uh, data of, of, of companies, of, of uh, organizations you collect, or is it also data about people or health? Or, uh, it actually started, it, it can be all sorts of data. Uh -huh. I use uh, open source uh, programming, which uh, are good for two reasons. One is uh, it's free, yeah. which is nice when you're starting your own company. And second of, uh, it's also very flexible. The disadvantage is that uh, there's no help really. Well, you no. can Google and you can find some answers, yeah. but it's not that user friendly. You have to figure things out yourself. But once you get rolling, once the ball gets rolling, you can collect all sorts of data. So for instance, uh, last night there's a, um, who is very interested in data in Denmark? Well, of course, it's uh, communications people, you know, social media, who shares what and stuff like that. And they have a, a, a website that they go to and uh, write articles to each other. 
So I scraped all articles yesterday and then I called Facebook, Google and Twitter and asked these articles, how many times have they been shared on your social platforms? And then you start seeing patterns like articles that are shared on LinkedIn are not shared on Facebook. So there obviously is a big difference. Like Facebook, you share things that are fun or maybe a little bit interesting uh, or maybe like things that get you mad, uh -huh. emotional stuff. Yeah. Where on LinkedIn, you share more like um, uh, business sort of things, uh, uh, articles on how to run a good business, uh, how to find the best employees and stuff like that. So that was interesting in seeing uh, just how different those two uh, social media platforms are when people start sharing things. Yeah. Uh, but it could also be a, a bicycle data. Uh, you know the open data movement, many governments uh -huh. want to uh, provide data. Yeah. I have some bicycle data from Copenhagen, so I'm looking into... So you into know when, where people are uh, traveling at their bikes? Yeah, right now I have uh, one station, uh, uh, one measurement station, and you can see like exactly, here everyone goes to work, here everyone uh, goes home, yeah. and then uh, I went to the weather stations, so I got the temperature and the rain and stuff like that. And I can see that every time it rains, you approximately see a drop in 9% uh, <laughs> of bicycles. Yeah. But the reason why I think about that is I bike with my uh, children uh, when I have to uh, send them to kindergarten and school. Yeah. And I, I ride past this one thing where I got the info and it always counts. It's just like you are bicycle number 1000 or 2000. And I saw that when the weather was raining, you had a lot more cars in the street and I was, uh, and there was a lot fewer bikes I could see on the on the counter. So I, 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 yesterday I just looked at how much does it drop, and it drops around nine percent. So my next uh, objective is to get the car data, because let's say you are a traffic planner or something else, you can mm. see whenever it rains, There's bicycle drops, and then everybody cars, goes into yeah, their cars yeah. because they don't want to get wet, get wet. You could build some smart services on that, saying that. Uh, Imagine an app that said, are you going to uh, take your car today? And you say yes, and then it says, I want to uh, notify you that it's raining, which means that you have to add maybe 15 minutes to your trip because 9% of all bikers, bicycle people, are now also going to, uh, to get in their cars. So it could, that, that way you could uh, sort of uh, do like an intelligent system that could yes. uh, warn you a little bit in advance. Yeah. Hmm. But then also like companies that just have a lot of data like 30 million lines of code from uh, packages moving around. I do a little bit from the postal service in Denmark. So you can see how the packages uh, are moving and, you know, yeah. it's interesting. <laughs> so it's from like the very small, just yeah. this is funny to look at to like enormous data sets where you try to get an overview of what's going yeah. on. Data are, are hot at the moment. Uh, everyone's talking about data. Data will tell us everything. They will help us get uh, healthier and uh, mm -hmm. better people. Is, is, is that... Do you feel the same about data? I do, but I, I think that um, I think let's uh, talk about uh, the health thing, for instance. Right now, it's extremely uh, well. Not, not if if you do like a health study or if you do uh, any sort of science in health, you take hopefully a random sample of the population and you try things out. You get this diet, you get this diet, you do exercise, you don't do exercise, stuff like that. And then they find out what works and what doesn't work. But what they found out was sort of like, this works for the average person. You yeah. might not be yeah. average, I might not be average. So one of the very interesting things that are coming now is instead of, let's say, big data, you could call it small data, data just about you. So you could uh, measure your uh, blood pressure all the time or your blood sugar level or your breathing or your sleep quality or the mm -hmm. air quality in your home or you could measure all your food down to the microgram with, with easy sensors yeah. and everything yeah and then you can uh, and then you can find out how do you react to a certain type of food yeah. or how do i react maybe i react differently uh, maybe you can eat the wheat and i can't or you can drink milk and i can't and stuff like that but when whenever you get the the big recommendations from like a public agency they of course look at the whole populations and say for the whole population, this is a good thing. But you, you are most definitely not a part of the whole population. None of us are. We are all different. So there's an era now where we will be able to dive into our own data and then get the recommendations for us. Also, like get personalized medicine. 
Um, yeah, I talked about this uh, hmm? with, with someone at the conference as well. I had myself gene tested also, so you know I can see what kind of medicine I react to and uh, which works and which. which, which yeah, for instance, like yeah. if I if I needed to have some sort of uh, of medicine, then I can go to my doctor and say, I have this list of of. Uh, people who has my uh, uh, gene profile react in a certain way to this kind of medication and then they can you know uh, give it to me or not give it to me you know it's a bit different yeah are you optimistic about the future i'm always i'm a very optimistic the future will only get better yeah i mean if you if you look at the numbers everything is getting better the only reason why some people have a feeling that things are getting worse is because Humans like to hear the bad stories, and with uh, cameras like these and live streaming, we're able to tell all the bad stories we can find. Mm -hmm. But if you look at uh, homicide, murder, poverty, pollution, even everything, but climate change is actually getting better. Getting well, better? No, I don't know if climate change is getting better, <laughs> but uh, pollution, uh -huh. uh, murder, all those things are getting better. Yeah, yeah. Then of course we have uh, stuff like uh, climate change, and, and I don't know if there's a uh, sometimes there's a solution like maybe stop it other times there's a uh, mitigation what's it called like okay we cannot stop it so what do we do maybe here in Holland you have to uh, Netherlands you have to build bigger dikes or you know something so yeah. there's uh, I don't know where to uh, to land on, uh, on that particular issue yeah yeah but in general you say well the more we know it is it is becoming a more peaceful world and it's becoming a cleaner world and a richer world uh, so I'm uh, always very optimistic. So uh, just like there's this little internet meme with like a picture of the USB stick and then a little funny comment where it says, this piece of technology saved more trees than Greenpeace. And it's probably true. So we have a focus when we are negative that we are looking at things right now and we cannot imagine it getting better. So we sort of take all the problems we have now and then we say, we will be more people. So. We just add the problems with more people and we say, so we will have bigger problems. Very, very yeah, yeah. Large problem. In, instead of thinking, okay, well, our technology is a lot different than it was a hundred years ago when there were even fewer people. Uh, so all those problems they had back then, they didn't just explode up to our time, we fixed them. We found a technology, we did something. And of course that will also be the case for the next centuries. And it will even be quicker or because technology just seems to explode and seems to go well a lot more happening it will be crazy yeah. it will go fast at some I mean uh, we are sitting here right now live streaming that probably would not have been very possible like just five years ago just because of internet connection eight years ago is when the first iPhone came. It's only eight, I think it's only eight years ago. I mean, just imagine now everything is the smart movement, smart devices, smart everything. It's eight years, it's really not that long time. What will happen in the next eight years? If you follow the Morse law, uh -huh. like the yeah. development of technology, in 10 years, the, the things will, uh, will be 10,000 times better. But that also means that in 20 years, it will be a million times better. So right now we are eight years away from the first smartphone. So in two years, we will have a smart device that is 10,000 times better than the first iPhone, approximately. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a cross between what it can do and what it costs. But in 10 more years, it will be a million times. <laughs> So I'm just asking you, can you imagine no, what uh, a million times faster or smarter or better a smartphone would be like? I don't know. Scary. Then, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And then you will have like, in a few years, you will have the first self-driving cars. You have self, you have driving cars, self-driving cars. Uh, Google has some in California. Yeah. And it's fun because the only accidents they have been involved in, there have been a few accidents, is when people drive into them from the from behind. <laughs> Because they, I, I think it's because they don't really act like humans. Like uh -huh. if the yeah, if the yeah, light is yeah. uh, uh, yellow, they stop. Yeah. And some humans are like, go you know, go go go, go, go. <laughs> and I, you know, and then they run into them. Uh, so maybe two three years, you will have the first uh, real self-driving cars, and then in 20 years, they will be a million times more advanced. I have no idea what that looks like. <laughs>
<laughs> but and, and it will be on all fronts. Like the the first uh, genome, I think it cost like a billion dollars, something crazy, and it took 15 years to take one human and sequence the whole genome. I'm not sure about these numbers, but it was yeah, yeah. crazy, crazy yeah, high. Yeah, yeah. Now, if I want to have my genome, not the full, but like uh, sort of like markers of the genome, it cost a hundred dollars. It's I'm, it's literally I think from a billion to a hundred dollars in maybe 20 years, yeah. and the next time it will be. Uh, I heard a guy with a presentation. He said it will probably be cheaper to sequence your genome than to flush the toilet. <laughs> And why don't we do it at the same time? So whenever you go to the toilet and flush it, it just sequences your genome on the way out. And then you have all your personalized data for wow, you. Yeah. Wow. And it will just tell you like, uh, maybe not so much red wine. Uh, you know. So well. there's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. So. Well, thank you very much for this uh, expose. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, You're well. welcome. <laughs> Tot zover. Dit was de laatste gast. We uh, gaan hier weg uh, met een, uh, op een, on a happy note. <laughs> Positive vibes here. Um, uh, bedankt voor het kijken. Tot ziens. <laughs>